Good morning. Good morning. Oh, that was pretty pathetic. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Good morning. Good morning. That's much better. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Father's Day, everybody. Uh, we are, are blessed to be able to gather this morning and yeah. get to uh, just celebrate so much that's going on uh, in our community and in our lives and in our denomination. Um, and I'll share a little bit with you uh, here in a minute about our, our annual conference that was held this past week. But... Um, Rick, I'm going to go ahead and let you do some announcements. Right? Okay. Well, we have the uh, usual grouping. I'll go through them quickly. The crafting group meets on Monday at 10 a.m. here at the, C at the uh, CLC. The Affinity Safe Place is uh, meeting on Tuesdays at uh, Nunnally for teens that would like to share their experiences, uh, have some issues resolved, whatever the issue may be, whatever they want to do. That's what for the, their time. Um, Bible study led by Jim. Are you doing that again yet? Yes. As okay. a matter of fact, All right. uh, we'll be getting, we're, we will be kicking back in after uh, a couple weeks off. And, okay. And uh, we'll be doing the fifth week of the study of John. If you're attending that uh, on Tuesday morning at 1030 here and at 6 o'clock on Wednesday evening at Nunley. Okay. The uh, Bible study on the Apostle John and we'll be doing week five. And there's also the men's and women's Bible study Wednesday evenings at 6 here at uh, the CLC in, at Bon Aqua. Um, the handy person group would still like handy people, so please let them know if you're available. Um, Duck River Praise Team will be having a sing-along here on Sunday, June 26th at 5 p.m. That's next week. It's next week. I won't be here, but enjoy. Let me know how it goes. Um, <clears throat> I guess you need to, do, need to be doing some practicing, huh? Uh, we, actually, we have been, believe it or not. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we practice about three hours every week. But uh, I invite you to come to that. If you didn't come to our last sing-along, we had so much fun. And we did some contemporary and yep. some traditional music. And we're going to to uh, follow that same format uh, next Sunday evening at 5 right here. But we ask you this time, if you want to come and bring a dessert or a snack there to share, go. we'll uh, get together in the fellowship hall afterwards and, uh, and just enjoy being together and, and uh, again, lifting our, our voices in praise and thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you for that. Um, we also have the fifth or sixth Bon Aqua food drop, which is also mainly supported by Helping Hands and uh, Feed America First. So, uh, and that's going to be Saturday, July 9th. Uh, we're setting up at 7 a.m. here at the church, and then the, the cars will start arriving at 8, and I believe we're trying to hand out 400 boxes. So, um, bring your work gloves. <laughs> And also, we have a fifth Sunday coming, July 31st at Kedron this time at 10 a.m. and fellowship uh, meal to follow after that. Anything else? Um, yeah, I want to just, if you don't mind, take a little bit of personal privilege, as the bishop would call it, um, and let you know a little bit about what happened at annual conference. Oh, good. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday of this past week. I'm not going to give it all away, but y'all are going to have to suffer. Uh oh. <laughs> because I came out of that meeting with my heart strangely warmed. Uh -huh. There are so many phenomenal things going on, and we were fortunate not only to have our bishop, Bill McAlilly, there, but also the president of the Council of Bishops, who mm. is basically the president of the United Methodist Church worldwide. Um, wow. And he spoke and, and brought several messages to us. and. And I have a kindred spirit with him. Believe it or not, the uh, president of the Council of Bishops for the United Methodist Church is from West Virginia. So something good did come out of West Virginia, <laughs> besides me. Uh, but there were so many things going on. And next week, for our worship service, we're going to be gathering our, the, the delegates, which were uh, Janetta. Ross will not be back, will he, next Sunday? He will be? Okay. Uh, myself, Bill and Debbie DePaul, and Roger McKee all attended uh, the conference, and we're going to be giving you a debrief 
uh, and telling you a little bit about what's going on. We hear so much garbage in the news about what's happening to the United Methodist Church. And let me tell you, if you had only been there, you would have seen a spirit and a passion and a love and an excitement for where we're going as United Methodists that I can't possibly describe. But I want you to be rest assured that we are in good hands and things are moving forward. And next Sunday, we're going to take time to, uh, to share the vision and to share what's going on and to share where we're going and just to, uh, to celebrate, I think is the best way to put it, uh, being United Methodists in today's world. So I wanted to take that liberty. The other thing that I wanted to do is in addition to today being Father's Day, we also are celebrating Juneteenth. And some of you are saying, what in the world and why would we celebrate Juneteenth? It's just another one of those made up things. But I want you to think for just a second. Back in the days when Lincoln freed the slaves with the Emancipation Proclamation, it took up to three years for that word to get to the people that were enslaved. Uh, so they were still held in bondage. Did you know that in Tennessee, there is still a law on the books that makes slavery and indentured servitude legal. Hmm. No, I did not. There is, and it's also in several other states, and that was one of the resolutions that we did, uh, that we voted on at conference, was to send a letter to the governor and to the representatives to ask them to remove that law from the, from the books of Tennessee. I had the opportunity to hear one of my colleagues, who is the pastor at Ebenezer United Methodist Church, which is a Hispanic church, uh, and we'd like to think that the oppression and the prejudice and all of that has been gone from our, from our uh, church and from our society, but 10 years ago, as they were trying to set up a, a Hispanic uh, worship in West Nashville, they were asked to leave the church because they weren't the right kind of people. Mm -hmm. They were, they, she said that she had one gentleman come up to her and say, I didn't know we had your people in our denomination. <coughs> That's travesty. So we do still need to recognize that there is an issue. And I want to read you something before we get started in our, in our full service. I want to read you something that was in the United Methodist uh, Discipleship Resources this past week. <coughs> My Morgan? Well, while he's doing that, I'll tell you, I saw something on the internet, so you can take it with a grain of salt whether it's real or not, but um, there was a gentleman, a black man, uh, that went to a, a local restaurant that he'd heard good things about, stood in a long line, got to the, uh, order his food, so apparently it was a, a takeout kind of place, and uh, was told that the food he selected wasn't available. And again, the same thing happened when he picked a different food. And again, when he picked a different food, they said, okay, call the manager. The manager comes and invites him to leave apparently because he's a black man. Well, it turns out he's the chief of police in the town, and he wasn't wearing his uniform. So he comes back the next day, and all of a sudden, everybody's all smiles and happy to help him. Um, so there's obviously still some areas and some people that, that have that problem of not wanting to treat people fairly. He didn't make a big deal of it, other than to bring it to the forefront and on the internet, it became a big blow up. People were saying things, and he tried to pu push it down to say this just needs to be settled locally. Don't get all upset and don't make all these statements. But it is illustrative that, that there is still that issue out there. Not hopefully very commonly, but it, it does occur. Well, it is, it is very common, and it's not just with the not just with the African-American population, but it's with the Hispanic population, the Asian-American population, 
women, um, all of those people that we think maybe don't belong with us, and we're going to address a lot of that next week when we talk about our direction as United Methodists. But let me read this to you. In late May of 2020, this should be better because somebody had turned the mic down to one. <laughs> somebody knew that I was going to be speaking today. <laughs> In late May of 2020, a world confined by the COVID-19 pandemic stopped for a moment at the horror of videos showing the death of George Floyd of Minneapolis at the hands of a city police officer. We offered condolences and prayers to the family. Some of us marched to bring national and global attention to the tragedy. Since then, the names of Dante Wright, Rayshard Brooks, and Daniel Prude have joined George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Aubrey just the most recent on a long list of African-American citizens who died violent deaths at the hands of those who wield authority in our society. Alongside these cases of brutality on black citizens was the rise of acts of violence directed at Asian-Americans. This woke many of us to feel challenged to do more. We post our anger and our rejection on social media, make public where we stand, show solidarity with our sisters and brothers of color, and yet we feel there is more to do. As a white Christian, I need to claim my own privileged status in society and understand that racism will never be fully purged from my soul until I admit that saying I am not a racist is not a completely honest statement while I enjoy the benefits that are bestowed because of the color of my skin. The best I can hope to achieve, that white Christians can hope to achieve, is to identify as actively anti-racist. Our baptism, in our baptismal covenant, United Methodists vow to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of our sin. We accept the power God gives us to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. These vows are not just what we do as individuals, but collectively as the church, to be agents in a world for the eradication of evil, injustice, and oppression. Dr. Martin Luther King, in his last book that he wrote that was entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? He tells a story of a novelist who had died and left, left a list of suggested plots for future stories. And he underscored one. A widely separated family inherits a house in which they have to live together. <laughs> Commenting on this plot, Dr. King says this is the plight of humankind. We have inherited a great world in which we have to live together. We have inherited a large house, a great world house, in which we have to live together, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu. A family unduly separated into ideas, culture, and interests, too, because we can never again live apart, must learn somehow to live with each other in peace. Dr. King adds, the choice is chaos or community. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Would you stand as you're able and join in our opening hymn? This is my father's world. We'll be doing verses 1 and 3, and the lyrics will be on the screens.
Would you be seated, please? Do we have joys and concerns this morning? Yeah. R-I-G-H-T? R-I-C-E. Chris Rice. R-I-C-E. Rice. I had right, W-R-I-G-H-T. <laughs> I got to get a hearing aid, I guess. All right. Thank you. And he's got a five-year-old daughter? Uh, it's about five, I think. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Anybody else? Yes? What's Greer? Thank you. When Jay and Betty's, one of your daughter-in-laws lost her mother this weekend. We've lifted up Chris Rice, who was tragically killed in a construction accident on Friday. Thank you, Pastor. I forget to repeat that sometimes. <laughs> um, anybody else? A friend that had been incarcerated is now released and, and taking it daily, and uh, hopefully we'll do well. Yeah. It's all right, Debbie. Okay. Go. <laughs> um, one of our folks on the prayer list, uh, Brenda Hustup, is she is super on the list. She has had her eye surgery. Her eyes have returned to functioning. She's good. Okay. We take her off the list. She's good. Thank you. Okay. Um, good. Um, hopefully I'll be here for that, but if not, we'll try and get it online when we get back. It's good to see Mary and Teresa back. It is good to see Mary and Teresa back. I hear things went okay down there. Yeah. Oh. Oh. So we may be missing another trip down there and meet them. Oh. But our time there was really nice. Okay. The time there was nice. We're just not sure of the end point. Um, yes. So Kara and Audrey are back from the trial. It turned out to be not guilty, but hopefully everybody will be able to put it past them now and go forward. I do want to share just a couple other things again. I, I can't stress enough what Debbie was saying is how exciting conference was this year. Um, with this is the first uh, meeting of the Tennessee Western Kentucky annual conference as, as a merged conference and there was just a spirit in the room and uh, we'll share more on that next week. I do want to let you know that from our Nunley family, um, Alice Lyles, uh, who is a member at Nunley, passed away this week um, and her service will be at Loretto Memorial Chapel in Loretto, Tennessee on Wednesday morning at 11 and they will have visitation from 4 to 7 and if you go to the Loretto Memorial Chapel website they have a place where you can sign the registry and offer your best wishes. Uh, Alice was a, a loyal God-loving person that meant so much to our Nunley family and, uh, and I'll be going down there to officiate the services on Wednesday. And uh, it, was, it was one of those things, we were sitting, we were at an annual conference, and I get a call from Sandy, who is her daughter, that 
they think that maybe she is in, in the last days or hours. So I, I left conference and took them communion and prayed and uh, spent some time with the family. And then she passed uh, early the next morning. So be in prayer for the Lyles family from, from our Nunley Church. Are there others? Yes. Thank you for sharing that. Henry Bledsoe from our East Hickman uh, church family was finally released uh, from the hospital this past week, uh, is at home and uh, receiving dialysis treatments at home. And not only is Henry just a, a model of faith, but he's also pretty doggone stubborn. <laughs> and I think that has served him well and we can learn a lot from Henry. Are there others? Francis. I saw that. I saw that on Facebook. Tim and Francis Hobbs celebrated 50 years. Okay, he <laughs> signed up for another 50. Okay. Okay, well, uh, our prayers are with you, <laughs> and our best wishes are with Tim. <laughs> are there others? If not, I invite you to join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and almighty God, we come this morning celebrating Father's Day and you being our ultimate parent, both father and mother. But today we celebrate the, the masculine side of you and we celebrate those who have been influential in our lives as father figures. We know that that's not always a good thing. We know that there are those that have been abused, those that have been hurt, those that have been, been damaged by those that consider themselves to be fathers. But they're not Abba, they're not Daddy. And we just ask that you be with those that have been hurt, but especially those that have had that example of a true father figure. And those of us that are our fathers, Father, we, gracious God, we ask you to give us strength and continue being the <coughs> example that you created us to be. We also lift up this morning all of those that society considers different, those of different races, those of different gender, those of, of different age, all of those that have been oppressed. And on this celebration of Juneteenth, when we remember the emancipation of the slaves, we ask that you continue to fill our hearts with that love for each other, the love that tells us to love our neighbors, that we are all equal, and that your love is for everyone, regardless, no ifs, ands, or buts. Father, we ask this morning as we hear the message, as we lift our songs in praise, and as we as we lift our prayers of petition and intercession that your Holy Spirit be among us and that you give us that comfort and that peace and that understanding, but you also trouble us and cause us to feel the discomfort of playing it safe. And as we negotiate the rough of life, the, the fringe areas of life that we sometimes avoid, help us to dive deeper into those areas, just as your son did. Be with us and guide us. Keep us safe. Be with those who are troubled and oppressed. We ask all this in the name of your son, who taught us to pray, Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, Give us this day our daily bread, bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen i invite you to stand as you're able 
And you can either take your hymnal or you can look on the screen as we do our Psalter, our responsive reading. It was interesting, the bishop this week when he was doing one of his messages said, remember when y'all did Psalters? <laughs> back in the old days when we did responsive readings? Well, we're, still we're back it. in the old days. Would you stand as you're able, please? Vindicate me, O God, and defend my cause against the ungodly people from the deceitful and the unjust. Deliver me. For you are the God in whom I take refuge. Why have you cast me off? Why must I mourn? O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the weir, O oh God my God. Why are you cast down, O oh my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? be seated and if our ushers will come forward we'll receive our morning tithes and offerings. Your eyes, please. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. <clears throat> Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son. Giving and gracious God, we lift these offerings as a symbol of our dedication and our support of the work that you've called us to do. We ask that you help us find ways to multiply these gifts, that you bless the gift and the giver, so that we can continue doing that work to which we're called. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Would you be seated, please? Now, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. I get so confused. This morning... Rick will be reading from the New Testament Gospel according to Luke. And I want you to pay particular attention about the man that he's specifically talking about. This is Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. They sailed to the region of Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore... He was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, 
And though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of Gerasenes, Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from the demons had gone out and begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. This is the word of God for the people of God. You can never find a good caddy when you need one. <laughs> There's a, a joke that I wanted to try to start out with this morning. And it's about a priest or a pastor. We'll go ahead and do that. And, and the pastor... Was he got up one Sunday morning and thought, gosh, this is a beautiful day. He said, you know, all, there's some of my parishioners, some of my congregation like to play golf on Sunday morning. I think I'd like to do that too, but I need to go far enough away where nobody will see me. <laughs> so he packs up his car and he drives to, to the golf course in the next county and he starts playing. And he is playing the best game that he has ever played. He is well under par. And he comes up on that, that 18th hole. And he tees off. And it's a 425-yard par 5. And he hits it. And... Lo and behold, it picks up and it starts to sail. And it goes and it goes and he's standing there wow. And all of a sudden it starts to drop and it drops right in the hole. And as it drops in the hole, St. Peter and God are looking down and St. Peter says, how could you possibly have let him play such a good game? And then he just got a hole in one on the longest par five in the county. Why did you do that? God looked at St. Peter and says, <laughs> Who's he going to tell? <laughs> you know, sometimes, how many of you play golf or have tried to play golf? Yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm at. I try. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And usually when I'm playing, somebody will hear four. And if you're not familiar with golf terms, that means look out. Look out because I have hit a shot that is going someplace that it probably should not be going. And lo and behold, you might be in the way. And then it ends up in what I have always played from, <laughs> in the rough. In the rough. Now, if you're not familiar, the rough is that area where it's overgrown and there's weeds and there's all kinds of stuff. And, and it's really out of bounds, technically. Technic should be. Should be out of bounds. Uh, you usually don't go into the rough on purpose. That is not intentional 
when you're playing this silly game of chasing that stupid little white ball around. And, and I want you all to pick up those golf balls and keep them and remember what we're going to talk about today. You have to hack through the weeds. You have to dodge wildlife. You have to try to find a way back to what that designated fairway, that, that nice, smooth, well-manicured area where you're supposed to be playing because that's what the rules say. It doesn't always work out that way. And if we are in the rough, we often find that there are a tremendous amount of obstacles that get in the way. Trees, people, everything. And, and if you play like I do, sometimes you're actually playing from the fairway, but it's the wrong one. <laughs> but that's part of the game. We don't like that. Now, you're going to say, Jim, <laughs> that was funny, and I appreciate it. You got our attention. What in the world does this have to do with Jesus? A lot. A lot. Because, you see, what would have happened if Jesus had stayed in the fairway? You know, when you play in the rough, there's all kinds of things. It, yeah, it can, it can add to frustration. Being in the rough is, is tiring, and it's frustrating, and you run into things that, that you really don't want to deal with. But then you also see things you wouldn't normally see. In the rough, you may find uh, golf balls perfectly good golf balls that somebody didn't think was worth the effort of trying to find. Perfectly good golf balls. Lost balls are in good shape but have been abandoned because they were worthless. It wasn't worth the trouble to go and find those lost golf balls. What would have happened, though, if Jesus had stayed in the fairway? on the well-manicured lawn of the Pharisees, of the well-manicured greens of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who made sure that everything was, was the way that religious people were supposed to have it. The greens were smooth, the rules were known, the people understood the way that they were supposed to be, and goodness knows you don't want to get in the rough. You don't want to get in the rough. Jesus' task would have been so much easier if he had been allowed to stay in the fairway where everybody understood the rules and where he was playing by the rules of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious people of the day where they kept everything manicured and they knew exactly where they were supposed to be going. But it would not have been nearly as productive. His mission would not have been nearly as productive. It was not what he was called to do. Jesus was not called to be in the fairway. Jesus was called to be in the rough because that's where we are. We're in the rough. How many people would have never heard the word of the gospel if Jesus had stayed out of the rough? And let's, let's take, for instance, what Jesus did as he lived there. What did he find in the rough? He found people that were struggling. He found people that were oppressed. He found people that had been abandoned by society, just like that lost golf ball had been abandoned by the one who drove it there. Those people, those people weren't worth the effort to go and find. And as we look at the scripture that Rick read from Luke, let's think about the demoniac. Now you talk about somebody playing in the rough. <laughs> he was so far outside the rough, he was way out of, he wasn't even on the course. But Jesus went to find him. He looked for him. He went into the rough. And it talks about the, uh, the land where Jesus was, was across the lake from Galilee. You talk about a water hazard. It was across the lake, but it wasn't just across the lake geographically. It was a completely different land. It wasn't even on the course because these were Gentiles. These were people that were not accepted. These were the people that had been left and abandoned 
by the religious people, by the Jewish councils, by all of those people who manicured the grass to make sure that the people that knew how to play had an easier time, had an easier way to follow the path. This demoniac was truly a ball lost in tall weeds, kind of like some of us. Jesus being there was completely out of bounds. Not only was it physically distant, it was home of the Gentiles. And the first person that he met as he went into this land was a man possessed by demons. He had been running around, now picture this. <laughs> he had been running around this graveyard naked for years. And people thought he was nuts. Can you imagine that? People thought he was nuts. People had banished him to a life of solitude because he was in the rough. He was rough around the edges. And goodness knows he didn't think what the religious people thought. He wasn't even in the same ballpark. But you see, Jesus found that lost ball. And when he found it, he cleaned it up. And he gave it a little bit of care. And it turned out to be something that was extremely valuable. That lost ball was the beginning of something for that Gentile nation. Now when Jesus found this, part of his cleaning it up was asking, What is your name? And the response was, Our name is Legion, for we are many. Now what does that mean? Twelve? Fifteen? Thirty? A Roman legion consisted of 6,000 soldiers. 6,000 soldiers. So when, the, when Jesus came up and the demons recognized who he was, he said, you know, don't, don't destroy us, just let us go into the pigs. Now we've got to remember, we're dealing with two different societies here. Because for the disciples, that should have been a good thing because, you know, they're looking at it and, and here these demons are going to go into the pigs and pigs are foul animals anyway. I mean, goodness gracious, we're Jewish people. We can't have pigs. So the best place for a demon to go is into a pig. But you've got to remember, you're in the country of the Gentiles and the pigs were a source of income. So when the demons went into the pigs and they rushed into the water and drowned, the people got upset. They first of all were afraid, and second, they were upset because there went their source of income. And what did they ask Jesus to do? To leave. And what did Jesus do? He left. He left. He wasn't welcomed there, even though he had performed miracles. Now, what about the man that was cured? What about the man that was cured? He wanted to go with Jesus. He wanted to stay with Jesus because he had seen what had happened. He had been released of this demonic presence, of this, this illness that he had had. He wanted to stay with Jesus. And I think if, you know, Debbie and Bill and, and Janetta and Ross and Roger and I maybe had a mountaintop experience this week. When we were at conference, we were on a high, we wanted to stay there because, man, it was powerful. But that's not what you do. You need to take what you have learned and come off the mountain and to spread the word. And that's exactly what Jesus told the demoniac to do. He said, go, go back to your village, go back to your people and tell them what has happened. Jesus told him to stay in the rough, to stay there where things are tough. Now what does that have to do with us? Well, on Sunday mornings, we feel pretty good about ourselves because you see, we know where we're going. We get up, and we come to church, and we know that we're going to be playing in the fairway because we make it nice and easy here. And we get up, and, and we hit a nice drive, and, and it goes, and it goes, and it goes. And we know that it's going to end up in the smooth grass of the fairway. And then that second shot. That second shot, we use our pitch and wedge and we chip it up on the green and we know this is going to be an easy putt. We don't have any challenges. We're playing right down the middle. We're playing right where we're supposed to be. There are no challenges. It's an easy putt. 
we knock it in, and then we take the ball out of the hole, and we go home. And then we congratulate ourselves on playing a nice game because we made it to church again on Sunday morning. And we pat ourselves on the back, and we had a good time. But what would have happened if that second shot had gone in the rough? What would have happened if that second shot had gone out of bounds? And, and some of us are familiar with the term a mulligan. That's where you just kind of pick the ball up and put it where you want to because you didn't like the shot that you took. Make it an easier shot. And when we do that, we don't get challenged. We don't take the ball and put it in the middle of vacation Bible school. We don't take the ball and put it in the middle of a food drop. We don't take the ball and put it on Tuesday or Wednesday Bible studies. We don't take the ball and put it in the midst of a rejoice of a song event where we do sing-alongs because that's in the rough and we're not comfortable there. We want our Sunday mornings where we get to play in the fairway. But let's just say that it goes into the rough and we have to play around some of the trees and the weeds or we have to go looking for that lost ball. Do we think it's worth it? Do we think it's worth it to take time to go and search for that lost ball? And if we do take the time, what are we going to find? Well, maybe we'll find three perfectly good golf balls that somebody abandoned. Maybe we'll find a snake. Because yes, when you play in the rough, you may find some things that you don't want to find. You may find that snake, that demon, living in the rough isn't easy. And then we hit that second shot. We hit that second shot and it goes straight as an arrow but it's still in the rough if you play like me. You hit it straight, you hit it long and you stayed in the rough. It's still out of bounds. We have a choice to continue playing in the rough or we have a choice to pick up the ball and make it easy. Pick up the ball and put it where we want it to be. But then as we look for the ball, lo and behold, somebody had dropped a hundred dollar bill in the weeds. We wouldn't have found that little gemstone had we not been searching for the lost one. The third shot hits the fringe of the putting green. And we have a choice. If you've played, you can either chip or you can putt. And if you putt, you're pretty safe. You're going to be on the green. You may not make it to the hole, but you'll have a good second shot. But if you chip it, if you use that pitching wedge and you chip up on there, you just might hit the hole or get closer. You've got to take a chance. And you take that chip shot and it drops in the hole. Now, what's happened? You still ended up in the same place as if you had gone down the fairway, but you were able to salvage lost golf balls. You were able to find a hundred dollar bill and you were able to make a new friend in a snake <laughs> or eliminate the demon. But you see, Jesus didn't have the opportunity to use golf as a metaphor. He used things like lost lambs, lost coins, lost sons. But the moral is the same. We can stay safe in our, in our faith. We can play it safe. And we can play a great game, but what do we accomplish? What good does it do us other than making us feel good about ourselves? Making sure we don't get poison ivy because we've gotten into the rough. And talk about the great game that we played. We have another choice to make. We have the choice of playing the fairway where everything's nice and smooth and predictable? Or are we going to intentionally hit into the rough? Are we going to purposely take the path where it might make us uncomfortable? It might make us do things. Are we going to stay in the fairway? Or are we going to play in the rough? People would say we were crazy if we intentionally played in the rough. People would say we were nuts, but we're in good company because in Mark chapter 3, Jesus' family thought he was crazy. They thought he was nuts. Early on as Jesus chose his apostles, taught truth and worked his miracles, his mother and his brothers were very concerned. 
But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. Would be in pretty doggone good company. Jesus chose to play in the rough. He chose to look for those lost balls, those people that had been abandoned by others, to face the demons and the snakes and to pick up those abandoned golf balls and to clean them up, to pick up those abandoned people and to clean them up, to pick up those abandoned demoniacs and to clean them up and to make them into people that he wanted to use, to make use of them. Now today... I want to challenge you to play in the rough. Intentionally play in the rough. I'm going to challenge you not to take the easy way and to hit that ball in places that might make you uncomfortable and might make you find some things that you didn't think that you were going to find, to play where you might not normally play. And instead of rushing through the game and seeing how fast you can finish 18 holes, take your time. Take your time to look for those lost balls, to look for those lost souls, to take the time to welcome those that may not normally be in the fairway. And I ask you to do this in the name of the Father, in the name of the, well, that's good, in the name of the Son. I'm going to get you yet. and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we prepare to sing our closing hymn, I invite you to challenge yourself. For some of you, playing in the rough might even mean going to the altar because it's uncomfortable, because it might awaken something in you that would cause you to go look for those lost balls, for those lost souls, for those lost people. So I invite you to join me, as always, as we sing our closing hymn and commit to playing in the rough. Would you stand, please? We have several of our youth going to camp this week. Uh, Ross, Addie, you going? Um, And we just need to remember uh, what they're going to be experiencing. They're going to be playing in the rough. 
I can guarantee you, they're going to be taught how to play from the rough. And we just ask that, that uh, you remember them in your prayers this week and uh, wish them safe travels and that we expect to hear good things when they get back. Rick? <laughs> Are you willing to play from the rough? Are you willing to take a chance and get out of the fairway on Sunday mornings and do what we're called to do during the week? I'm going to steal a benediction from, the, from, Pres from uh, Bishop Bickerton, who is the chair of the president of the Council of Bishops. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bring you his peace. Now, get out. <laughs> get out and do the work that you're called to do. Get out of this place. This isn't where the church is. Get out of this place and go and find those that are oppressed and that are hurting and that are hungry and that are sick and that are in prison and do what we're commanded to do. Get out of here. Would you join me in the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Go and make disciples. Amen.